Ladies and gentlemen from around the world, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, no matter where you are, welcome to the webinar. We call this one Compete, Make Better Decisions and Engage Your Talent. Sounds like a very broad topic, which is what we wanted to start with, and we're going to refine that a little more. Before we get into that, though, I need to introduce my co-facilitator for the day. This is the managing partner of the Chapman and Co-Leadership Institute. She has a background in both sales incentive programs and actually building culture inside of our parent company, which I realize we mention from time to time, but we actually don't discuss it. So I will mention what our parent company is that Sarah helped start, kind of what I would call a cultural evolution within that organization. She also comes to us from Fairbanks, Alaska, by way of Washington University right here in St. Louis, Missouri, where she ran college admissions. So for you that have college age kids and you want to know how to get your kid into an Ivy League school, you need to email Sarah, which we will give you those emails at the very end. She has three first names, but they're put together as a middle and a last and a first. I'm going to give them to you in order. You're going to give yourself a high five, a self high five. It looks like clapping because this am? is Sarah Nicole Hannah. Yes. Am I giving the high five? Yeah, just like that. that That's was, good. Is that what Deborah. we're doing? Okay. I think everyone okay. else is. We're plotting I, hope, I, think, I think they're doing it. I think by this point, you know, we're nine, let's see, 14 webinars in. So I think they're doing it. Yeah, All right. Probably. My co-facilitator for today is Matt Wyatt. Um, as many of you know out there that are listening to us, Matt's background is in the U.S. military as a commander in the United States Air Force. I'm particularly important for the topic today. One of the questions a colleague of ours asked Matt once, um, and I think he, this might make sense to all of you, um, is how in the world did you last so long where there are so many rules? And why is that important for today's topic? It is, because we're talking a little bit about how do you adapt? How do you innovate? How do you create change from happening? Uh, and so if there's anybody who understands how to do that inside one of the world's largest bureaucracies. Um, so how can you do it even when you don't have the conditions that would, would necessarily lend themselves to a lot of adaptation? Matt's going to be sharing a few stories with us today. Yeah, great. Thank you, sir. And one way that I know that you can test and say, am I in a bureaucracy? There is no penalty for saying no. That's when you know. All right, let's talk about Barry Waymiller just really quickly. This is our parent company. So we're not just a consultancy. We sit within this larger construct. Barry Waymiller is two, actually two Germans, Mr. Barry and Mr. Waymiller that came over in the 18, uh, 1880s and started uh, one company and right here in St. Louis, Missouri. It was bottling. They did pasteurization of, uh, there's was a reason you could get fresh beer outside of city limits and bottle washing machines. So from two team members in one location and one company to present day, we're about 12,000 team members all over the world, over 100 locations in 28 countries. The majority being North America and Europe. We do have uh, organizations in India and over in China. I put the bottom here, this revenue percentage, because we wanted to show you this isn't just about being nice to people. There's an intersection between people and business that we reside in, our consultancy resides in, and we know that with the people being bought in, uh, leaning into a lot of these things, our revenue uh, increase there, you can see that is some of the best in the world. And we did it since 1987 because that was our first acquisition, which brings us to why the Leadership Institute is here. After about 110 different acquisitions, people were asking, well, how do you guys do that? What's the thing you're doing inside? It's a lot of the work that Sarah was formative of. I was doing some similar work in the military and Sarah and I started the Leadership Institute about five years ago. We work primarily with uh, external companies to share both the learnings of Barry Waymiller and the learnings that we've had from the outside as well. We do everything from assessments. We have a free assessment now that we can give you for your team, and we'll mention that at the end. Uh, and I should have mentioned it before, Courtney uh, Godfrey's backstage. She's helping us out. So she'll be putting those in and helping us out. If we mention something that's of interest, just put it in chat, and she'll make sure she answers that. We do leadership development, everything from 360s to higher-end senior C-suite kind of development. We have training courses like inclusivity training, workshops and keynotes uh, when necessary, and then, of course, the consulting. So that's what we do. We have three values. We seek to understand, we show up to serve, we make it better. So a lot of the reason we ask Mentimeter questions, even on a webinar, is we're constantly trying to understand what are you going through as an organization so that we can serve you better and it actually makes it better. Two resources you're going to have, and I'll mention these at the end as well. One is we've taken our entire width and breadth of our people development and leadership curriculum and put it into a virtual classroom. Very similar like the ones you're seeing now. It's highly interactive. They're all live facilitated events. 
and right now we're selling the access into that virtual classroom to organizations. We have tracks ridding from aspiring high potentials to frontline management and senior leaders, as well as some topical tracks on continuous improvement, customer service, inclusion. I know inclusion, diversity, uh, and equity, I think for us in the US right now, and I think around the world, but especially in the US, has become a topic that should be talked about, and we have some resources on there. If you go to ccoleadership.com slash resources, and in fact, you'll see it on our top banner of our website as well, you can go right to our inclusion resources. A lot of stuff, it's not gated. We don't take credit card information. Just go there, grab it. One of our partners in this space is Fred Falker. His TED Talk and some of his commentary is available there as well on our resources page. All right, but that's enough of what we do. Moving into this, let's talk about some housekeeping. And when I think housekeeping, we've patterned these recent webinars off of sports. So we think housekeeping, one of the things that makes everything shiny and new is the Zamboni machine. So it scrapes off the surface of the ice, puts new water down, and it looks brand new. It's interesting that there was a person named uh, Frank Zamboni Jr. He was born in 1901 in Utah to Italian immigrants. So he developed this thing. It was made from an A-20 attack plane, an oil derrick, a Jeep engine. And he thought that was going to be it. It took him nine years to build this thing. And then in the 50s, Chicago Blackhawks, the, Sh the Chicago hockey team there, they bought two of them. And ever since then, any machine is always referred to as Zamboni, even though there are several ice scraping and cleaning machines. Its max speed is about 9.7 miles an hour, but what you want to know is you're muted, you use Q&A, you use chat to contribute. A lot of learning comes from you. So Courtney's going to be backstage chatting you up and asking some questions. And of course, there's a survey at the end and we really value your input. I know you're thinking, I was just in this webinar to talk about startup mentality and now I know about Zambonis. There you go. You're All right. Welcome. In addition, Yes, all the slides, the resources, a link to this webinar recording, we're going to send these to you. And we'll send them to you direct via email. They'll also be available on our website, ccoleadership.com. I recognize that I might be the only one that finds this slide hysterical, but it says hindsight. Those really were the droids you're looking for. Here's why this slide is funny. <laughs> I'm going to put a mansplain. Why I can explain this. the joke? Yes, I totally am. I love that it's a stormtrooper. He like comes home and he's like at his Ikea table and he has his hand and he's got like a TV remote control. Like he's just destitute. And so I find this a lot funnier than it should be. Sarah, let's get serious. Go. <laughs> all right. Um, as most of you know, we do enjoy interacting with you all and we use Mentimeter as our way of doing that. So I'm going to ask you to grab your smartphone, smart device, um, and or open up a second browser on your computer and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Um, enter the code 572759. It's also in the chat for you to access. Um, once you're there, we're going to ask you a series of questions. Um, a lot of you have this figured out. And for this particular warm-up question, I was really excited that Alaska was winning um, for a little bit, but then it, it kind of fell down the list. And in Asheville, North Carolina seems to have some fans out there. Um, I'm not sure the person who put in Matt's spare bedroom, uh, but if that was a serious response, I encourage you to email me um, before Whatever. you make that particular life choice. Um, so just a warm-up question, if given the choice, where would you live in the world? Most of you have figured uh, that one out. I also appreciate the person who's just like off the grid, oh, somewhere, just off the grid. I, I hear you. I think most of us feel like we are off the grid at the moment. All right, a few more questions that are a little bit more on target, and we are going to go deep with you all straight out of the gate. So usually we ease in, we ask you a few stats, and maybe your opinions on some things, but this is a webinar about how do we compete, um, how do we adapt, um, perhaps how do we make some change. And so we're going to break that down both into individual as well as from a standpoint inside the organization. So. For you all, what is one personal development goal that you want to make in the next 12 months? We see some things coming in, and I, in a broad spectrum, which is fantastic, everything from stop being a people pleaser uh, to a professional certification to increasing sales skills. Perhaps we need to volunteer more. We're going to improve our English. Uh, we're going to do some coaching. We're going to do some regular meditation. Um, we're going to inspire a vision. Sorry, I'm going to just take over really quick because yep. I think the, your audio, quality my audio is starting to come in all over the place. So Sarah's going to Sarah's going to switch her mic up 
and we'll see what we can do here. And I'm going to ask you the next question. All right, so the first question was, what's a personal development goal you want to make in the next 12 months? So then we have all of these things, everything from coaching, listening, better listener. Let's go to the next question, and that would be, then what's going to hold you back? So as Menti advances here, what's the one thing that holds you back from achieving that goal? Whatever that might be, whether it was a coaching certification, okay, me, myself, hey, what holds you back? I do, but maybe a little more, maybe a little bit more tactical or tangible. Um, like, okay, as an example, is it the fear of, of that I'll have to let go of something? Is it finding the right fit? Um, is it time? Is it finances? Lack of skills? skills. Those are good. Prioritization. My, my tone of voice. Sarah's going to end with her mom voice, speaking of tone of voice. Finding the right fit, self-confidence, prioritization. A lot of you saying right at that time center portion of this, like, well, I'll tell you what holds us back is completely about time. There's a reason we're mentioning this. So the first question we asked you is, what's something you want to do as an individual that you want to change and what holds you back? I'm going to shift now and I'm going to ask it from an organizational perspective. So in this case, What's something in your organization, what's one thing you think you need to do as an organization to compete better in the next 12 months? So we call this webinar Compete. We're going to talk about startup mentality and all those kind of things. But what's the thing that you need to do to compete better? Okay, increase accountability. No one ever sees, no one ever says, by the way, we need to decrease accountability. Culture revamp, relationship building, embrace technology communication. This is always great because you guys might get some really great ideas from each other. Like, oh, that's interesting. Like that one person just put in sell. We hear you. We hear you. Reduce time to market. Uh, clear strategic plan. Better marketing. Trust more. Perhaps to some people that I think you wrote like slow down. That's a great one. We'll mention, we'll mention about how we reset the board, how we think about these type of things. Cross-train the team. It's another great one. These are all things that, of course, that we're also kind of dealing with. All right, so same pattern here. This is something that I, we need to do to better compete as an organization. So then the next question, of course, is then what's going to hold the organization back from achieving that goal? Your perspective, your opinion. If I want to be better marketing, if I want to cross-train the team, what's going to hold us back a little more tangible? I think it's easy to say, well, we're going we're gonna to hold us back, but like, can I, can I get a little bit more in there? And if you've already inputted something, you can input more items. Not listening to the front line. It's an interesting one. Mindset. Talk about that finite mindset. Strong personalities. These are all great. Sarah, how's your audio now? You want to check? Well, you all tell me. How's this? Is yep. this better? All right. Yep. You're back on. So... As you all put this in, we're going to ask you, we ask you from the individual perspective, and then we ask you from the team or organizational perspective. And so we want you to hold on to both, both, both. What was the goal that you had? Not, not good. Sorry, Sarah. Sorry. We're going to try to get, Sarah's going to work on her audio one more time. I'm going to bring us back into here and just keep letting us know. Letting us keep knowing about uh, the audio quality because what I'm hearing, I want to make sure that you're all hearing it as well. And I don't want to cut her off if it's actually broadcasting just perfectly fine. So let us know in the feedback. And we apologize. It looks like we're having a little bit of a rough day from an internet bandwidth standpoint. Uh, Menti code is 572759. That is correct. Let's make sure that Menti code is right on that one. One second. 572759, that is the Mentico. We will be asking some more questions for you there in Mentimeter. We realize as we're working around the world, there are three things organizations are talking about. I know these are generic, and there's more than three things, but this seems to be the commonality. By the way, why did we put a picture of Ronaldo there? This is his new team, and this was the first picture he took when he scored a hat trick, three goals, whether it's in hockey or whether it's in football or soccer, it's a hat trick. These are the three things. One is return to office. Basically, let's get it right. Number two is we need to change this company to serve in a post-COVID environment. Um, as we mentioned before, about 95% of organizations are saying they are not going to be the same. It might be better, it might be worse, but they're not going to be the same. So save the business. And the last one, diversity, equity, inclusion, we need to be better. And so these are the three items that people are talking about. The commonality, of course, in all three of these are that we are trying to, we need to make some change. And change basically is defined as make or become different. 
I know we have this sports theme running through here. So this is Deion Sanders. In October in 92, he played the football game. The Atlanta Falcons played the Dolphins in Miami. Then he flew up to Pittsburgh and played in the National League Championship game uh, for the Atlanta Braves. And uh, Sarah, we're going to check your audio by asking you, what right. was Deion Sanders' nickname? Prime time. <laughs> I like you can see the gears. Hold on and got it. Prime got time. It. That's got right. It. Your audio sounds, your audio sounds great right. and you're we in. Go for it. It's the problem. All right. Uh, startup mentality. Um, this is an imp important piece from the standpoint of regardless of the organization that you're in, whether you are actually a startup, um, or you're in a gigantic organization, this is kind of the idea, do we, do we have the mindset that we can rapidly reset the game board? And um, to give you a really tangible example is we're talking to clients, especially during this time, what we're hearing a lot of right now is, well, we said some things three months ago when we all kind of walked out the door and um, responding to COVID or perhaps kind of remapped our essential business. Um, and now those things aren't working for us anymore. Um, we're starting to realize it's going to last for a lot longer than we thought. We're bringing people back into the organization and have to deal with kind of all of the health and safety concerns. But we said those things. And do we actually have the mindset that we can bring our team back together and say, um, we have new information. We made some decisions based on our best thinking at the time, um, but we need to reset the chessboard. Um, and we need to make, maybe we need to reverse some decisions that we've made. A very tactical, a very simple one, but I think it's, germane to a lot of us is a lot of people say, well, we didn't make people turn on video for all the conference calls that we're in. Well, it's no longer working for us. Um, and I actually need to see people. This is going to go on throughout the summer. And so are we bringing the team back together and saying, based on our new fresh thinking, this is how we're going to move forward. And are we conditioning people to the fact that that's going to happen quite frequently? It's what startups do, but sometimes we kind of lose that ability or at least that thought that I can actually reset the chessboard. So that's the first piece. The second piece is most of us know what our change goals are. Um, it was not a problem for you all to fill out that word cloud. You did it very easily. What's the thing that I need to do? What's the thing that the organization needs to do? Um, so coming up with the goal in and of itself, not the problem. Um, most of us know that there's some changes we need to make. So what are those change derailers? You are welcome for the pun. I'm just hearing some, are we good on the sound? I heard some feedback. Still good? Uh, you're starting. Okay. Gary says it's okay. All right, so we break those two changes down into technical and adaptive change. Um, so two ways that you can think about this. Technical changes are the skill set necessary to perform the behaviors is known. Um, I can actually apply a new process, a new system, um, to that change. Adaptive change is, I don't actually know the skill set. Um, it's actually going to require probably a new way of thinking. I need the organization as a whole, or perhaps I need myself to actually think differently. Um, we know that the best way to tackle adaptive change is with others. Um, so we typically can't do this on this on our own. It's something that we need to engage people in. And so the bulk of the webinar today is to give you a process to actually address adaptive change. Um, which links to one of our very favorite Rumi quotes, which is, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world, and today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. Okay, so we are going to talk a little bit, and I'm, I apologize for the audio quality. We're still working on that, and we'll get it cleared up. We uncovered, so this work is built on two authors named Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy. We've done some work with them. They're Harvard professors. They wrote this book, Immunity to Change, How to Overcome and Unlock Potential in Yourself and Your Organization. We really like the construct that they have, and they have uncovered this phenomenon called the immunity to change. It's a hidden dynamic that actively and brilliantly prevents us from changing of its devotion, preserving our existing way of making meaning. I know it's almost neuroscience doublespeak. It just basically means that we have an immunity. We push back against change, sometimes in a subconscious level, because we're changing what, how the world made meaning of it in the first place. So we think about immunity to change and we're given a choice. This would be the Robert Frost, two roads diverge in the yellow wood. Sorry, I could not be one traveler and travel both. The image of this, and when it comes to choice or making a change, do we recognize what we're giving up and what we have moving forward? We're gonna be working through this program, this sheet, this template. I believe you received an email today for some of you. Um, 
uh, for some of you should have seen these slides coming up uh, and Sarah sent those over earlier and Sarah are you seeing slides I'm getting some people from the chat that they're only seeing Mentimeter you see slides great I do sorry, see for the the, slide sorry for all the tech issues we're having today that's unusual for us so we're working through this all right this is the immunity exchange worksheet we're going to do it from an individual standpoint all right so we asked you earlier what's an improvement goal and then what do you need to do differently so I want you to select a new behavior you've considered in the past but haven't been successful in it. Perhaps it's one from a lesson learned exercise you've done. We're gonna completely just improvement goal and what I need to do differently. And rather than us just sitting kind of silently and letting you reflect on this, I'm gonna share with you an example, all right? And so I'm gonna share with you my improvement goal. My goal is to spend more time being a parent. I have two young boys, they're nine and 11. They drive me crazy, I've locked myself in my spare bedroom in the basement to keep away from them because they're monsters. But as a parent, I'm supposed to love them and pay attention to them, so that's my goal. I wanna attend more of their events, and I, it sounds like I'm a politician, be a more present leader to the people. I think it basically was trying, just trying to say, like, I'm just gone a lot. And so I lead a leadership institute, I co-lead that with Sarah, and so the ability for me to lead the team and be more present. What I need to do differently is I need one, to go less, uh, and two, make the kids and my team a higher priority. So those are my stated goals. Pretty simple, and I think a lot of us might relate to that, especially as we climb in our career. Man, I'm spending too much time at work, or what's the adage, right? No one on their deathbeds said, I wish I'd spent more time being in business. So what is the change I need to make? I need to be a more present person, especially with my kids. So then the behaviors that I do or don't do that go against those goals. So what are the behaviors? What happens? It's the thing that gets in the way of me uh, doing this goal. All right, so I'll reveal these two as well. One is uh, I book back-to-back -back meetings, and I did this even before uh, the virtual world, and now it's probably even worse because now I literally can back back-to-back -back meetings on Zoom calls. I literally have to lock my Zoom room because I send the same link out so that other people don't join in right away. Back-to-back -back meetings. Um, it's very rare that I say no to a client. If a client wants us to do some work, I'll figure out a way to make it happen. Um, I usually say yes to any travel that comes down, it doesn't matter where it is. All those great places you list in the beginning, I would go there, I would also go to any other place you could list. I'd be like, well, I've never been there before. Let's go. I double book myself sometimes, and then I also think I can fit it all in, and then either end up rescheduling or I just fit it in. I, my workday begins after my work is over. So a whole work day from eight to five, and then I think, okay, now I've got the rest of the eight hours to do my real work. And then I start making excuses that, look, if you're a partner in a business, that's, that's too bad. That's what you're supposed to be. And so I want you to list some behaviors. Think about those behaviors that go against the goal. So these are behaviors that I do that ride right up against my goal. The resistance to this change. So in other words, I've said I want to spend more time with family. Here are the behaviors I literally do right that goes right against it. That resistance doesn't reflect my opposition, nor is it just inertia that I've gone so far down one path. Even as I hold this sincere commitment to this change, I'm applying productive energy towards some hidden competing commitments. If I don't name these or actually literally do the thought exercise through it, it makes it very difficult. And you can see the words from Bob and Lisa here, the result stalls the change effort and what looks like, what looks like resistance to change, like you literally don't value your family, is in fact my personal immunity to change. So I'm gonna give you another analogy. My brother has this car. This is a Tesla P90D Model X. It is an unbelievable piece of engineering. So my mom would drive this car sometimes. So I go back to California, my mom my brother would be in the front, my mom's driving the car. Now when we were growing up, my father, it was pretty much known, we would drive in a 1978 Caprice Classic, two-tone blue station wagon, and, event, and eventually my father, within probably the first 10 minutes of driving, would say to my mom, we'll call her Colleen, because that's her name, Colleen, why are you riding the brakes again? My mom learned to drive with two feet, and she's very cautious, which means both those feet sit on both the pedals. And sometimes the gas pedal and the brake pedal is pushed at the same time, which drove my father crazy. I'm in the Tesla, fast forward a number of years, just recently in the Tesla, and the car keeps making these chiming sounds I'm in the back. It's just chiming, like a ding, ding. And so I ask my brother, I'm like, Andrew, what's wrong with your car? What's happening here? My mom looks back and says, we want to talk about it. And so it keeps doing it and it keeps doing it. And I said to my brother, like, Andrew, why is the car making the noise? Because with a Tesla, 
it works on energy savings. And so anytime you press the gas pedal and the brake pedal at the exact same time, the car gives you audio feedback and it cannot be turned off. And so now riding with my mom, the car just chimes the whole time, which I don't know how my brother deals with it, but that's a whole nother story. This is the same thing. It's like working on a goal simultaneously having a competing commitment is like driving with both pedals pressed down, one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas, while the whole time saying, I want to go faster, and unknowingly, your other foot, usually the left one, if we're on the place where you drive on the left-hand side, on the left foot is still hitting that brake pedal. So let's talk about how we get into there. Sarah? All right, so if we've outlined our goal, we've said this is what I need to do differently. Here's the behaviors, here's how this showing up. That's kind of the first half of this exercise. The second half of the exercise is really to unpack what is basically, what's the brake pedal? What's the thing that I'm hitting and I'm doing and I might not even be realizing that I'm doing it? What are those hidden competing commitments? What motivates you towards the behaviors in number three? And so there's something that's underlying that behavior. Um, and what perhaps am I committed to more than the goal? I'm yeah. sorry, Sarah. I'm sorry. And, and group, I'm let me sorry, know. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. We're working on it. Okay, so the hidden commitments, and I think if you caught what Sarah was mentioning there, which she was saying much more eloquently than I'm going to say is, what motivates me toward the behaviors that I do that go against the goal? Like what motivates me to be traveling? What motivates me to book back-to-back -back meetings? So this is what's really interesting. So for me, I have to list some of these competing commitments. So for me is, I really enjoy a different challenge, and I enjoy the really tough ones that can't be solved really easy. In fact, it's not just one solution. There are probably multiple solutions and layers. I like the mental challenge of it. I like the new and the different. It's not just repeating something. Um, selfishly, it feels great to be of service. We enjoy the work that we do. Um, I really enjoy meeting new people. I don't, I don't know that I'm a people person, but I enjoy meeting new people. Um, freedom is a value that I hold really dear, which is interesting. So I spend a lot of time in the military I don't mean it from a defending freedom. I mean, personally, I love personal choice. And the other competing commitment is my family relies on me to provide for them. Um, in this case, both uh, my wife and I work, but I'm the major breadwinner. And so then, therefore, there's just a heavier reliance on me. And so I have to list these out that say, here's what the hidden competing commitment is. The last part of this construct is, then what assumptions Am I holding like a belief? An assumption is something I believe to be true without it being factually proven. What assumptions am I making that hold each one of the commitments feel necessary? So I'm, ba I'm backing into this. What assumptions do I make? What do I believe that makes these hidden commitments real? And then I keep doing the behaviors and I justify it, which rides all the way against my improvement goal and what I need to do differently. So I'd, since this is like just group therapy time for Matt, I'm going to share with you here are my assumptions that I make. Uh, one assumption is that I cannot find the excitement, the challenge, and the newness by staying here home in St. Louis. One that I would add really quick between the first and second one is, I'm making the assumption that I can't do this same work virtually, that I need to get on a jet plane, I need to travel, I need to be in my executive platinum status in American Airlines, and I need to sit in those comfortable seats and have a drink and fly around the world. Um, I am making the assumption I have to travel to get new clients. We've disproven that one, I'll tell you that. I'm the only one that can do some of the work, so I have to go. I'm not being arrogant here or confident. I'm just telling you this is my assumption. Remember, not proven. It's what I might believe. Um, partners in a business like this one, I'm supposed to work hard, and I'm supposed to sacrifice more. And if I don't travel, frankly, I'll look lazy. Like, why are you home when the rest of the team is traveling? These are all the beliefs, the assumptions that I'm making that literally justify all against my goal of I need to spend more time. If I can't rectify these things or disprove or prove the assumptions and then hold up the commitments and say, do I really feel like that's necessary, then I won't make any progress on my goal on the left-hand side here of spending more time. I'm going to ask Sarah to jump in on this one as well because I don't want to miss out on this. We'll see if we can get her commentary going. Okay, we're going to keep trying. Yeah, we're going to keep I trying. If like not, just put it in the chat room too. Yep. I do like that the very nice people in chat were like, it's, it's okay. Like you can be scratchy. You're very kind people. Um, so this is a list of questions. And as we always do, we'll send you the slides to say, if you use this exercise with somebody, here are the coaching questions. I know a lot of you were on the coaching webinar last week. And so if you're to say, okay, I want you to fill this out. 
I want you to kind of talk through this and here are the questions you can ask to actually coach a person through. So rather than saying, well, that's not your competing commitment or you should try this, this is an alternative resource um, that you can help kind of unpack with somebody or perhaps you can do it for yourself. What's important to you about this goal right now? How are you gonna know when you're successful? And um, what is your first step? What does this mean to you? So this is just a cheat sheet to turn this tool and this exercise into an actual conversation. The second piece of this is this works both individually and for teams and organizations. Um, and so this is why we divided those two questions at the beginning. What's your personal goal? But what is your team or organizational goal? And as organizations, we also build up some of this immunity to change and identifying it can be the first step to actually achieving those goals. Um, so what we're going to do is this is not a free ride webinar. You guys are going to solve um, a real kind of challenge using this framework. Um, and so we made up a goal that might be yours, um, but we know a lot of organizations at some point in your journey say we just need to be more innovative. Um, so the premise that we have for you is if your organization's goal is to be more innovative, how does this construct work? Um, so to get into it, we have to define it. Innovation is the creation, development, and implementation of a new product, process, or service with the aim of improving efficiency, effectiveness, or a competitive advantage. Two sports examples in swimming, the laser suit. I know it kind of got a lot of news, a lot of world records were smashed, and in fact, it's no longer eligible for use because it became about the suit and not about the swimmer. So an innovation in sports, and then, of course, probably a controversial one, instant replay um, used in the American Football League, um, but also um, in the Olympics as well as an innovation to say, did we make the call correct? Um, so if our goal is to become more innovative as an organization, um, we can work the same process through. So we're going to answer these questions together. The first piece would be, um, what do we need to do differently to be more innovative? So we're asking you to imagine as if this is your organization and you can use real examples um, for the company that you're in. And um, what would your organization need to do differently to be more innovative? Um, so some good ones starting to come in, um, except benchmarking. Um, I'm gonna read into that one and say, perhaps we're fighting against no knowledge. Um, we need to break the routine. Um, actually spend some money in R&D. Um, first, we have to collaborate, um, listen to the people. I like that somebody brought in the diversity piece and we would argue, yes, diversity and inclusion. Always important to say that piece out loud. Um, are, are those voices being heard? Um, empower the employees versus one specific group. Perfect. All right, so these are the things that we need to do. Um, the second question in our construct is what behaviors do we currently do or not do that go against an innovation goal. So what are the actual things that we do um, that go against the innovation goal? Failure to invest, and um, certainly I'm not putting money towards it. Um, reactive, so perhaps we're waiting for our competitor to release and then okay, we'll, we'll go the direction that the market is going. Um, building silos, um, so not having um, the, you know, kind of building up where we don't have the communication between departments. Um, we don't, uh, we act on the known um, versus are we willing to take the risk and ask, act on the unknown. And I like this one, throw out ideas too fast. Won't That's work. Won't work. Um, so what, and this is the really important part about this step is I want the specific behaviors because if they're too big, they're hard to attack. So I want to know literally what are you doing and what are you not doing? And Sarah, here's a good one where people fly below the radar. That might be a U.S., more U.S. term, but it basically means I'm not going to offer something up because it's a personal, perhaps career risk to me. This rides directly mm -hmm. against psychological safety. I'm not going to say something for fear of it not being a good idea or being liked, and then they associate the idea with me. Yep, that's a good one. All right, our next question in the model as we're working through this. So what motivates these behaviors? What's the hidden competing commitment? What do we value more than perhaps innovation? Um, and so I would give you one could possibly be, um, I don't wanna disrupt or upset the apple cart for our sales team. If we have a new product, then my sales team isn't necessarily gonna wanna adopt it. Um, this is a good one, leadership control. I actually want to approve the ideas and I'm not actually really willing 
um, to let somebody newer in the organization take a flyer on something that I don't necessarily need to know. Um, perhaps there's personal agenda in, personal agendas involved. Um, a yeah. lot of org chart, um, yep, navigating that. That's why a lot of times uh, organizations will pull out like a skunk works or a innovation group that sits outside the hierarchy to make this work. Yes, yeah, so in the chat room, we had uh, Hippo, highest paid person's opinion. It's a great one, right. right along the line of the org chart and associating someone's rank or structure or hierarchy in the organization, your position, along with the intelligence of the idea that it becomes, oh, that's so much more important. There's a reason when yep. we do strategic planning for organizations, we make it very objective so that we can avoid those we would call pet projects or whose idea was it and associating that. That's a great one. And I like the person who just put in my paycheck. That's why. <laughs> just gonna just gonna do my job, people. I'm just gonna do my job. All right. And then the final piece of the puzzle. Um, what are the assumptions um, that or the beliefs that we hold that make each hidden commitment feel necessary? So what are we assuming to be true in the organization? May or may not be true, but we're making a really big assumption. Um, so one would be, uh, my customers want me to customize. Um, they don't really want me to think of the new ideas, they just want a custom product. Um, paycheck comes back again, I, I hear ya. Um, assumption they, and perhaps that's the hierarchy, don't want us to take risks. Um, a big assumption could be nobody is interested in my ideas. Um, perhaps I've been shot down before, perhaps um, even reprimanded before. Uh, trying to be all new things to everyone um, instead of taking care of the constituency that we have right in front of us. Uh, no one else wants to change. I'm the only one. I'm the Don Quixote. I see all these potential, but everybody else is perfectly happy doing, doing what they're doing. Um, so appreciate you all putting those in. Um, and it's kind of, this is the beautiful thing about this exercise. All of these could be simultaneously absolutely correct. And it's the thinking um, that's really, really valuable. So we're going to walk you through um, the worksheet that we kind of pre-filled out. Um, so if we're taking on this goal of innovation, this is how perhaps um, we would see this tool being used. And Sarah, just because we've had some audio quality and they haven't had a chance to hear you, would you mind going through this and taking the run through the rest of it? And then I'll offer the story that we discussed at the end of this, but would you mind? I could offer the Air Force story if you want. Go for it. Okay. No, I, I, <laughs> I only know the clip notes, so it's not going to work. Um, so if we're thinking about from immunity to change for the team, as we mentioned, to be more in, innovative is the improvement goal. And um, here's just some of the ways we would think about it. What do we need to be, to, what do we need to do differently? This is a little higher level. Um, we need to be a market leader. We need to iterate more rapidly. And we need to diversify our product mix. So we've kind of articulated where we want to go. Um, the behaviors we do or don't do that automatically go against the goal. We take limited risks. And perhaps we actually reprimand team members who get too far out, out on the limb. Um, we don't align our incentives properly. Perhaps the incentives um, push people to historic product lines, and there's no way I'm going to mess with my paycheck. The hidden competing commitments, um, we don't want to lose who we are. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit more emotional. Like, I don't actually want to give up the legacy. Um, a, an example of this would be Kodak. Um, we've mentioned on a previous webinar, they actually invented digital photography. They invented the product that put them out of business because they couldn't see that they were a memory keeping company they weren't a film company. Uh, how do we hold on to our existing sales talent, um, perhaps a low tolerance um, for failure inside the organization? Um, big assumptions, only a few people in the organization are capable of innovating, um, our sales team can't adapt, um, perhaps our customers prefer who we are today, um, and innovations won't align with our brand image. So what are those assumptions? Um, which I, I mentioned in the intro that um, doing this inside a very, very large bureaucracy has its challenges. So Matt's going to talk about that as it relates to the Air Force. Yeah, and in, in, in any large organization, right, the interesting part is you probably have a lot of the resources perhaps you could bring to bear, but in a bureaucracy, it's easy for the answer to be no. There's just not a lot of risk in that. And so we saw that a lot when you were doing in your own organization, what keeps you from being more innovative? Is it the ego? Is it the risk? Is it I want to fly below the radar? So as a real example of this, for example, the, the U.S. Air Force, and this isn't to be controversial or talk about the military, I'm just talking about an organization and ideas. 
So the Air Force actually was not the one that kind of pushed forward the idea of drone technology. And I don't just mean from a weapons standpoint, I mean from a weather standpoint, from a surveillance, from reconnaissance, all of those things that we've used in a variety of different things, from military operations to tracking flood lines, those type of things. The Air Force was pushing back against this. One of the reasons why was it took away from literally the brand identity that the Air Force is about a person, a pilot, a human being, piloting and driving a vehicle flying an aircraft. Being innovative for the Air Force was to let go of everything that it was founded on. I started with Barry Waymiller. We were founded on bottle washers and pasteurizers. It represents, I think, less than 1% of our business today. We had an entirely different business. We had to let go of those things. And there were some hidden competing commitments, both in the Air Force and in Barry Waymiller, to be able to do that. Um, I don't want to lose, quote unquote, who we are. This is our tradition. This is what made us who we are in, in general. This is why having a sense of purpose to come back to allows us to be able to change more readily. So Sarah mentioned the Kodak example. They were a memory company. I want to preserve the current moment for a recall at a person's whim in the future. Had they thought that way, then inventing digital photography, they would have seen that even though it's going to cannibalize their entire film industry, which it did, um, it's not, they need to be something different than a film company. It also works in these very small micro parts when I'm a team. Listing what these things are allows you to see how people are thinking about it. And perhaps, I'm not saying this is the case, but perhaps if we were to list and say, hey, one of the behaviors are that I feel like every time we offer an idea, it gets shot down or we're judged on it. That's a great conversation to get into from a leadership team and then start making some of these conversations about, all right, well, then what are the assumptions we're making. Especially in this case, you might be having to innovate into an area that doesn't align with what you've done. In the past, we have said online virtual training is not as effective as in person. That might be true from a scientific portion of this, but at least it's something. If it's at 85 or 90 percent of what the in-person experience is, then we need to be doing both of those things. And we've learned that actually the virtual, if it's live facilitated, it works really well as a sustainment tool to help the in-person events. So that's an example of where you kind of rub up against these big assumptions. But I don't want to just leave you with, oh, that's great. I guess you can list all the ways we're kind of broken and failing to change. There are ways to move forward. This just puts it all out in a very nice template to look at what are the things that ride against us making some change as an organization, as an individual. And Sarah's going to lead us through those. All right. And so we are not going to leave you hanging on this piece. So great. You told me we make a lot of assumptions and we got a lot of competing commitments. So what do I do about it? Um, essentially, the next step is to work that worksheet backwards. Um, and so to look at each of the assumptions and figure out how do I prove or disprove each of those big assumptions. The easiest way to do this is through conversation. Um, so who do I need to talk to or what are the questions I need to ask to find out um, whether we believe this to be true or not. Um, then evaluate each competing commitment against the new goal from a priority standpoint. If the things you listed in the competing commitments are actually more important than the original goal, um, and we, we stay away from, and we're waving, it's gone scratchy again. Yes? Yeah, it's gone pretty bad. I'm so sorry. That's going to take you to the end, right, guys. I'm sorry. Bad internet. Yeah, Court, let us know how it is for you. I'm picking it up just barely being able to understand. Uh, Sarah, people are saying it's okay, so why don't we keep going? All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take each of those competing commitments and we're going to stack it against that goal. And the, the reality here is if those competing commitments are a higher priority or more important to you personally, um, our recommendation is then don't set the goal. And so that's the real tough conversation that you have to have and why in a lot of organizations we set these goals, but we don't actually ever come to fruition or not to fruition in the way that we would like to. Do we have those tough conversations up front about what are we willing to let go of or what are we willing to release so that that goal um, can come to fruition? If the new goal actually is the most important thing, then how do I triage into what behaviors, systems, or processes need to evolve for the change goal? All right, we have reached the point where we ask you all 
Um, and I'm getting a question from Lisa. Can you give a brief illustration? Um, so using the innovation example, um, and so I, if I can think of an actual client story, um, I, I'll, we'll see if Matt can think of one. But if I just use the innovation example, um, one of the ones that we bump up against all the time is incentives. And so if it's, it's what's an example of a system or a process, it would be, okay, we want to be more innovative. We want to be more innovative, but my paycheck is linked to selling the historic product line. Am I actually willing to put money towards the new product that I want to sell? or to this effort. So that would be an example of a system. Um, another one would be using the innovation example, um, am I willing to dismantle the hierarchy? And so am I looking at approval um, structures? Um, am I looking at um, who can choose where and how money is spent? Um, mentioned previously, this is why organizations will pull out a group and say, well, I can't dismantle the entire hierarchy. That's not possible, but I'm going to pull this group out and I'm going to run them a little bit quicker, a little bit far, farther and faster. Um, so this would be a couple examples. The behavior piece, um, that's where, where you get into, are we talking about psychological safety? Are we teaching people listening skills? Um, are we teaching people problem solving? And um, perhaps we need to bring in design thinking. So there's also a behavior component that we need to bring in as well. Yeah, that's good, sir. The one I would offer, it's a great question, Lisa, appreciate the, the, the question on this one. One I would bring in is sometimes the improvement goal was to be more collaborative. Because a lot of times I'll back in to say, okay, well, to be innovative, we need to be much more collaborative here to those ideas. So we'll run through here and one of the hitting competing commitments are, we incentivize people based on their individual performance. So if I have different locations and one location is being incentivized to be the number one, that fights, literally fights against collaboration. Because if I'm number one, then I get the promotion, I get a higher amount of incentive for my variable comp plan, my people get promoted, everything's fighting against be collaborative, share information. Why would I wanna share information when really what my goal is, you've set it up this way is to win. The big assumption they were making is that if I don't incentivize that, my productivity and my performance will drop off of my team members. In this case, they need to realize that and say, if you're willing to let go of external uh, incentives, that's the only way you're gonna get to be more collaborative because right now you are literally asking people not to share information. You're literally asking them to win and compete. I know the title of the course was a long trail to work it right back into the title. You're literally asking your people to compete, not collaborate. And just as, as we move into the last piece of this, um, and this, Bob and Lisa will talk a lot about this in the book, but just to illustrate how strong this immunity is, um, and from the personal change standpoint, they'll talk a lot about weight loss. And so if, if you're an individual who's been told by your doctor that you need to lose weight for health reasons, that you, there is certain death um, if you do not lose weight, um, that is not strong enough for change to happen. Um, and so you think about it from a standpoint of a technical versus an adaptive change, is it as simple as, well, I just need to exercise more, I just need to eat the right things, and I can handle it from a technical standpoint, that works for some of us. Um, for others of us, whom it's a whole mindset shift, it's a whole behavior shift, I'm holding on to some things, um, even the threat of death is not enough to create the change to happen. I have to uncover what's the hitting competing commitment and what assumptions am I making so that that All right, we're going to bring you guys into, and, and happy to answer any other questions that you have. You can feel free to put those into Q&A. And um, we're going to bring you back into Mentimeter. And um, as we like to do, I'm um, ask you all, what's one thing that you might try or do differently as a result of this conversation today? Um, as always, this is not feedback to us. This is feedback to each other. Um, perhaps something that you're going to try is going to inspire somebody else to try something a little bit different. Um, so if you could take a minute and put that in, we'll make sure that you get this PDF. Um, so you have a cheat sheet of potential action items um, that you would like to use. Um, so one, use the worksheet. This is so helpful. Appreciate that. If you did not get it, you'll definitely get it um, in our wrap-up email. Um, so everybody will have access to both versions of, of the worksheet, um, which is a great way to have a conversation um, with your team. Question the assumptions I make at a minimum, no, just, right? Yeah, I would just say, sir, it's such a great way to work it through with the team to get some really good, and if it's an external facilitator, or if it's an internal one, we've done this exercise with people virtually, but just even getting a lot of that out, you'll see how fast we ran through this with some examples, but that concept, like you'll start getting into how is the system, how are the systems in the work aligned 
How are the incentive programs? You can really unearth some of these things. And sometimes it's really fast. And sometimes it's, wow, we're really going to have to think about this. But at least that way, you're not setting a goal that everyone realizes that's just something corporate asks for. We're never going to hit that. At least we're going to actually decide whether we're going to have it, lean in and do it or not. And at a minimum, are we just naming the assumptions? And sometimes the naming it helps solve it because people go, oh gosh, that's not how I would have viewed it. So, okay, let's have a conversation about that. Um, I appreciate the person who put in, like, do the worksheet, but do it as a pair. So grab somebody who can help think this through and then ask each other those open-ended questions to help kind of get to the next layer and the next layer uh, of what's driving some of those things. Yes, yeah, sir. Maybe one thing, we've done this with leadership teams as well after doing a 360. So you can see how this would match up. So if you have a leadership team that's trying to be more cohesive and collaborative, I might do a 360 to where they're getting feedback from their leader, their peers, their direct reports, they're getting that 360, then they're making a decision on what are the personal development goals they're going to make from a 360. Then we're putting people in accountability pairs to discuss and coach each other. And so this is where you'll see it becomes very factual as a, as a uh, immunity and change sheet, becomes a little more factual for people to have that conversation. Then getting into some team goals. All right, and the final piece of this, we're gonna throw up a poll um, right in the Zoom, um, and this is feedback to us. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a quick second to fill out, um, we do make changes and adjustments and we're always looking at your feedback. So that poll is up for you to respond to. I'm gonna appreciate you answering the quick, quick four questions that we have. Um, we will stay on um, and answer any questions that you have. So if you do have a question, you can put it into chat or Q&A, and we're happy to answer those, those questions as well. Yeah, and so appreciate your feedback. This is a picture of the loudest stadium thus far in the world. This is the Kansas City Chiefs, actually, the Zero Head Stadium, where the NFL team plays. They're at 142.2 decibels for a little bit of reference there. The rock band is right around 130. 130 is right around a jet aircraft taking off as well. And so you can see some of those related, but that is a loud, loud stadium. So thanks for the feedback, really appreciate it. As we move into, we're gonna be having the last of this series webinar, it's called WIN. We're gonna do a little bit about customer experience and a service mindset. We've done some work with that inside, both inside Barry Waymiller and with our external clients. So we're we'll working on that one. So you can see how this went, training camp, assessment in the lineup, building the bench, compete and winning. And it makes more sense when we say all those together, we realize that when we take them out and then we're like, welcome to compete. Like, we really need to describe that a little more. So we appreciate that part of it. Also. Uh, we have a couple of offerings for you. So as mentioned, we're going to launch the virtual classroom. This goes live in the middle of, of July. So give us a call, email us if you're interested in that part of it. And we mentioned these are the different tracks. We have a lot of the inclusion resources. Just go to ccoleadership.com slash resources, grab any of those. Also, I'm going to ask Courtney to put this in the, in the chat room. A lot of you had mentioned, like, what holds us back? Um, boss's ego, um, perhaps it's uh, afraid to kind of step up and be heard while listening. We have put on our website now a link that allows you to run a survey with your team. And so it's a 12 or 13 questions that we've pulled from our own survey that hits people, the behaviors, purpose, how people align to the goals of the organization, and then how the work is structured. You can run those with your team and receive a report all online. There's no gated content. There's nothing to share. You can just go in there, click, I want to do this, put in your team members emails, it'll send the survey to them and they'll be able to get it back. A great way then to get into this conversation, you're gonna get some real good feedback that turns your perception or gut feel directly right into, hey, this is what the facts are from how people are responding. And if you're not the person leading that team, forward that to someone in your organization. They can just come in and grab that and run it with the team. So those are the three offerings and I think Courtney just put it in there, so really appreciate it. All right, so as Sarah mentioned, we'll hang on. Sarah's gonna turn into mom mode and say something mean to you guys, like clean up your room, eat your vegetables, wash your hands, something. I'm gonna get some music ready to play. Go outside, you're driving me crazy. That's, <laughs> That's the much. best one. That's the best one yet. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. It's nice out, I can't get mine to go. Like, go outside, get some yeah. exercise. All of you, you're all driving us crazy. Listen to the song and then go outside and play. We'll see you later. All right. Have a good one.